I wonder if it's a little bit like like with football. You know how the little small schools will start. All right, good morning, Mac. You can we stand this morning? Money from it that helps the program. Let's just take a second to welcome our Evangel Experience students this morning. Woo! It's so great to have each and every one of you here. So let's sing this morning just about how Christ dying on the cross for us was not the end. It was truly the beginning to all that he has for us. So let's, so let's sing this morning. And I know who I am Cause I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the start And now I am chosen Free and forgiven And I have It's worth the living, yeah. Cause I wasn't made to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. And I was made for more. So why? running my way I know I am yours and I was made for more sing hallelujah you call out my name so I'll sing out your praise hallelujah you buried my past I'm not going And I was made for more. So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours. And I was made for more. Cause I
is running my way. I know I am yours, and I was made for more. Yeah, let's just give him some praise this morning.
you've saved us God you've saved us from our stress you've saved us from everything in our lives so that we can be in presence and communion with you and with each other we thank you so much for your death on the cross we thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives everyone for everyone in this room that if they are struggling if they don't know who you are if they are struggling with depression or anxiety or are just feeling stressed and tired that they would be relieved and feel the only peace that they can get from you we thank you so much again for the empty tomb. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, thank you so much, Sammy and uh, Ben. We just love your uh, hearts for the Lord, and we thank you for sharing your talents with us this morning. Good morning, evangelists. Welcome to all of you who are joining us here in person, and welcome to those of you who are joining us online today. We're so glad you're a part of our MACU family. Today, we've expanded our MACU family, and that is with about 80 students who are here for Evangel Experience. Let's welcome them again today. Uh, we're so glad to have you here. Uh, we're praying for these students as they are exploring God's call upon their life, and we are hopeful that they'll come and join us here as part of our MACU family. So great to have you all here today. Today, we're blessed uh, to welcome Brad and Crystal Kendall. Uh, they're joining our MACU family this summer, and uh, now to have a chance for Brad to come and lead us in chapel. Uh, Brad's parents were in the very first class of the South Texas Bible Institute in 1953 that later became Gulf Coast Bible College, which is what uh, Brad graduated from in 1983. Then he went on to Anderson University. So he's an alumni of our, of our university, and he's now here to lead us as the university chaplain and executive director of spiritual formation. He's going to lead our campus ministries team and spiritual formation team in helping all of us to be growing in our faith. But most of all, he's a man who loves the Lord deeply and loves our students. So let's welcome our university chaplain, Reverend Brad Kendall. <laughs> Good to be here. Well, I am honored to be here, both in my role as the university chaplain, but also to be here and share with you what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart today. A few months back, I walked into the room of a dying young man. Uh, in case you don't know, I was working as a chaplain in hospice at the time. And if you're unfamiliar with it, hospice is for the care of those who are dying. He had been told by a doctor he would not live beyond six months. And uh, in the reality, he was at our particular inpatient unit because his uh, life expectancy was down to weeks or even days. 
He had abused his body with alcohol and drugs and had subsequently been in and out of different hospitals and rehab facilities. And over the course of time, I suppose he had seen a lot of different chaplains. And uh, perhaps many of them, or at least some of them, had a different belief system or faith than what I have. And so his first question for me when I walked in the room was, what kind of God do you believe in? That sparked a rather interesting conversation. We talked for a long time, and the end result of that conversation was Robert, I'll call him that, giving his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked a little further. He decided he wanted to be baptized. And so a few days later, on a Saturday, we brought in his family, had the privilege of baptizing him, and I could just see the joy and the peace uh, come over his life and I knew that he would live out his last few days in peace, knowing he was going to go home to be with the Lord. And I believe I will see him in heaven someday. But that question he asked me lingered in my mind. What kind of God do you believe in? And I think it's a good question for you today. What kind of God do you believe in? Well, I think Luke chapter 15 goes a long way in answering that question, and so we're going to look at it today. Some call this Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Other translations simply say the lost son. But I think it is really the parable of a ridiculously loving father. I want to summarize it for you because I have a feeling that most of you have heard it, or at least many of you. So we have this young man who has gotten tired of living under his father's roof and his father's control and of all of the scrutiny that went along with that. And so he gathered up all of his things and he even asked the father for early inheritance. He took the money, the things, and off he went, the Bible says, to a distant, faraway land. And there, the Bible says, he engaged in wild living. Now, I don't know a lot about first century wild living, but I guess we can kind of use our imaginations here and figure it out. But anyway, you know, he had a good time. He had lots of friends around him, but all of a sudden when the money began to run out, the friends began to run away. And uh, that may be a lesson for us in life that when the money runs out, sometimes the friends run away, at least if we have the wrong kinds of friends. But now he can't even eat anymore, can't sustain himself. And so the Bible tells us that he came to himself. And what that means is, is that he realizes that he's reduced himself to feeding pigs in order to survive. And not only feeding pigs, but the Bible says he was starting to steal the feed or the food destined for the pigs so that he himself could have something to eat. Now, if you are imagining this story in a Jewish context you realize what Jesus is implying about the level to which this young man has fallen. Because pigs were unclean, and certainly their feed was unfit for humans, and yet here he was stealing feed, stealing food from pigs so that he could survive. So the Bible says he came to himself, or he realized the situation that he was now in, and he made a determination to repent and to go home. The Bible says that he began going home, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, went to him, and wrapped that coat around him that he so much needed, and put the ring of sonship back on his finger, and embraced him with love and compassion, and received him back into the father's house. I just find that to be an incredible story a wonderful story of a father's love. I think one thing about the story that is significant to me is it shows us that we have a God who stays. Now, what I mean by that is that um, the prodigal son could have come home to an empty house, but he came back home to a father who was there ready to receive him. God did not abandon him. Our God is not a God who abandons us. He looks for us. He loves us. 
And I can kind of relate to this in a weird sort of way. Um, when I came to this institution, it wasn't in Oklahoma City at the time, but when I came as a freshman, I completed my freshman year and then went home back to Kansas where I was from and uh, I was gonna work on a farm and my parents had moved to California. <laughs> it was so strange going back by my house and realizing that's not your house anymore. Your family doesn't live there. They're gone. Someone else is sleeping in your bedroom. Weird. And I suppose that's what the prodigal son could have experienced had he gone home. But he went back home to a God who stays. Now, I have to correct the record. My parents did tell me they were leaving. They weren't like, oh, hey, let's get out of here while he's gone. But anyway, you can imagine how disappointing the son would have been to come home to an empty house. But our God is a God who stays. And this is something you need to know. Uh, you know, I was your age as a college student one day, and now I'm a lot older than that. We won't get into specifics. But one of the things I've learned over the years is that those times in my life when I thought God had abandoned me, it wasn't true. God stayed. He's the God who is with us through our difficult times as well as through our good times. And in those times when we can't see him, perhaps that is when he's even most present with us. I think sometimes it's a little bit like a baby playing peekaboo. Um, have you ever done that? You don't have to raise a hand. But, you know, you put the blanket over the baby's head and the baby has not learned what child psychologists call object permanence. And so when you take the blanket down... It's like you appeared out of nowhere, you with that goofy face and all going peekaboo, peekaboo. Anyway, I realized that that's kind of what my life at times has been like. I've wondered, where are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? This is when I need you the most and yet you're gone. And then I figure it out. I've got the blanket over my head. It's me who has stopped looking for God and not God who has stopped looking for me. Because our God stays. Psalm 37 verse 25 is one of my favorites. Is it on the screen? Okay, good. Once I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Wow. Now godly here doesn't mean perfect. It means that you've committed your life to Christ and you're following God. And yet the godly have never been abandoned. God always is there. He stays. But that's not the end of our story here because we find out that our God is also a God who cares. He cares deeply for his children. In our text today in Luke 15 verse 20 it says, So he got up, the son did, and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The compassion, the love of God for his children is amazing here and incredible. God wants nothing more. If you happen to be one of those who has gone your own way, he wants nothing more than to run to you and wrap you in his arms and love you and forgive you and bring you home to restore you just as you are. He's waiting for you because he is a God who stays and he is a God who cares. And now let's pick up our story again in Luke 21 or verse 21 of Luke chapter 15 as we see a God who forgives. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to him, Servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Wow. What an amazing picture. You know, the son here didn't even get a chance to ask his father's forgiveness. His father just saw him and ran to him, threw his arms around him and forgave him. And that's the compassion of God. That's the forgiveness of God. 
The father says, hey, we're going to have a party. Fire up the barbecue. I mean, I bet they had a great time. There's two things here I want you to think about quickly. One is that if you've been walking away from God, just kind of doing your own thing, uh, it doesn't have to be that you've fallen into gross, gross sin, but you know in your heart, right, when you've turned away, when you're putting your will above God's and you're kind of doing your own thing, you don't have to get it all fixed. You don't have to make everything right. What you do need to do is turn around. Turn around back towards the Father. And the posture of the Father in this story is just amazing. He's scanning the horizon. You know, he's not waiting for the Son to come crawling back, groveling, begging for forgiveness. He's just looking for his Son to make that one step towards the Father's house. And then he goes to him and receives him with open arms. What a beautiful picture of God's forgiveness. Now, yes, we do need to repent of our sin, which means that we go a different direction. But the father could grasp the heart of the son. He knew that his son was repentant, and he treated him like a son again, much like the song that we just heard a few moments ago. The point is, is that when we repent and turn our hearts towards home, God forgives us and he throws our sin into the sea of his forgetfulness to remember it no more. If you were to ask God about something you did in the past that you've already gotten uh, forgiveness for, he would say, I don't know what you're talking about. Not because God doesn't have knowledge, but because he has chosen to forget. He won't hold it against you again. Because he is the God who forgives. And finally, I love this part of the story. He's the God who runs. Not away from trouble like he's scared, but he's the God who runs toward us. All throughout the Bible, we see our God as a God in motion. Um, in Genesis, he's the God who walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day there in the Garden of Eden. In Psalms, God is depicted as riding on the heavens. I mean, I don't know. Does he have like a, a heavenly Harley? Like, whoa. You know, I don't know. I can, I can kind of picture that. Kind of got the ZZ Top beard flowing back in the wind. You know, I just, that's the crazy way my mind works. But not only is a God who rides across the heavens, in the book of Exodus, he is floating as a cloud of smoke by day above the Israelites and a pillar of fire by night. Now, that's some cool stuff. That's really great. What a wonderful depiction of God being ever-present with his children. I also like it in uh, 2 Kings where it says God is riding or driving a, a chariot of fire. As he swoops down to pick up Elijah and bring him heavenward, it says he was caught up in a whirlwind and there was the Lord in a chariot of fire. Man, that is heavy duty. Maybe he even has like a, a low rider where he's like, kabonk, kabonk, kabonk. <laughs> I don't know. I would if I could. But this is the only place in all this scripture that you're going to see a God who ran. And again, not away from some kind of problem he ran toward his child who had made one step towards home because it says he saw him from a far distance and he ran to him. What an amazing picture of the kind of God we serve and we love. He's running to a child that's coming home. He's saying, I forgive you, I receive you. I want to go back briefly here to the story I told you about Robert and tell you how I answered him that day. He said, what kind of God do you believe in? And I said, I believe in the kind of God who makes paper airplanes. What? He said, what in the world do you mean by that? You see, I have a son, my own son, who was lost too far away from the father's house, doing a lot of things that were much like the things Robert did and lots of other things that as a father I don't even want to know about, right? 
He was certainly living his own life and had found it very unsatisfying and very unfulfilling. And he had reached the point where he was considering ending his own life. And not only was he considering taking his own life through suicide, he was trying to figure out, how am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And he was walking around the streets of Warrensburg, Missouri, trying to decide how he was going to end his life. And it was a cold, blustery day. There wasn't anybody out on the streets because it was miserable. And all of a sudden, from out of nowhere, came a paper airplane. And it flew by him. And it landed on the ground. And it kind of teetered back and forth there for a few minutes. And now it had his full attention. And then all of a sudden, a big gust of wind came and it picked that airplane up in the air. And that airplane circled and then it banked and then it came right by him. And he said, Dad, the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Son, I will make you fly again. And so he turned that one step towards home. And his life didn't, didn't change instantaneously. But God began a work in him of redeeming him. And now he is loving the Lord and serving the Lord. So when Robert asked me, what kind of God do you believe in? I said, he's the kind of God who makes paper airplanes. But they're paper airplanes that can lift you and carry you. And I told him the story of my son. I don't know where you are in your life today. Maybe you're broken. Maybe you're wondering if there's a purpose to it all. You don't have to fix it all. But you do have to turn around and take a step towards him. And he's there at home. He stayed. And he cares. And he forgives. And he runs to you. We're going to sing a song and we're going to pray a prayer. And you can make this decision right where you sit, but I think sometimes it's much more effective if we will make a, a move. And so we do have altars here if you'd like to pray. And, and you just want to say to God, God, I'm coming home. If that means you're accepting Jesus for the first time, there will be those of us that are willing to pray with you and help you on that journey. But I welcome you. Let's stand together as we go to the Lord in prayer. And then Kevin is going to sing a song for us. Almighty God, I want to thank you for being the God who stays, the God who cares, the God who forgives, and the God who runs. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for answering that question for us. What kind of God do you believe in? If there is someone here today that needs to turn towards you and come in your direction so that you might receive them, redeem them, forgive them, and save them, we pray that that would take place right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause. Cause I feel just like a lost cause If I were you I would have turned around and walked away I would have labeled me beyond repair Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair But somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here and You're the God who stays you're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stays. With wide open arms 
And you tell me nothing I have ever done Could separate my heart from the God who stays God who stays and I just pray for those of us that need to turn around and see you I just pray that you would please just let them know that you're not a God that's gonna punish or do anything bad but you're a God that's loving and that you're gonna comfort them. And God, I just pray for the rest of our day that we can just remember that you're here for us, that you have good plans for us, it's true. Even when it might seem like it's not, God, just allow us to remember that. It's in your name we pray, amen. You guys are dismissed.